Hi, this is the Hungry Math Professor here. Thank you for coming to my channel. And today we're going to read, uh, we're going to discuss um, this essay called What Numbers Could Not Be by Paul Benassaraf. This was originally published in the Philosophical Review in 1965 as a as a individual paper. And then I'm reading it in the, the collection called The Philosophy of Mathematics Selected Readings, which is edited by Paul Benassaraf and Hilary Putnam. Um, so this is a big sort of anthology of of all kinds of different papers that are put together that could, you know, make up a philosophy of mathematics course. I haven't read every single one of these papers, but I have read a good selection of them that that seemed interesting to me. And this is the second edition, and apparently they made a big uh, change in the selection from the first to the second edition. So today we're going to read this this particular. Uh, essay, and I think I'll discuss several other essays from this collection at some point. Um, but so what does Paul Benassaraf do in this essay, right? So he starts out uh, in a very kind of fun style, I would say, where he describes these two um, kids, Ernie and Johnny, and he says that they're sons of militant logicists. And what he means by this is that uh, the, the these parents are so, you know, uh, into their logicism or whatever, that they teach their kids math by teaching them set theory, which I'm not aware of really anyone doing this, though there's probably some example in history. But, uh, you know, generally we get to set theory much, much later in in our, uh, under, you know, in our um, learning about mathematics. But for Ernie and Johnny, they learn set theory from the very beginning. That's how they learn mathematics. Okay, reasonable thing to do. Well, you know, that's something we can do. And but then, you know, they have to understand like all these other like the common mathematical things that we talk about, the natural numbers, the real numbers, the rational numbers, you know, the, the things that all the rest of us are taught about in mathematics. Ernie and Johnny need to be taught what you know, how is that related to what they learned? How is that related to set theory? Right. So um, after they're taught sort of what these objects are and how to work with them, then they can communicate with just about anybody, right? So in that sense, it is a reasonable way for Ernie and Johnny to learn, right? If they're willing to learn set theory. Now, what sets up Banasaraf's ultimate point in this paper is that he has two kids, Ernie and Johnny, because they learn what the natural numbers are in a slightly different way. So for Ernie, he learns the natural numbers uh, as the what's called the von Neumann ordinals. This is typically, in my experience, what is used in set theory. The convention that's used in set theory is what's called the von Neumann ordinals. I won't try to say it out loud. It won't help you for me to say it out loud, uh, but you can look them up and it's not that difficult to understand what they are if you've never seen them before. So that's what Ernie's taught, what the natural numbers are. Just a particular way of expressing the natural numbers inside of set theory. But Johnny's taught a different um, version of what the natural numbers are inside of set theory, and those are called the Zermelo ordinals. And these two are named after these famous, you know, um, Zermelo and, and John von Neumann, these famous uh, mathematicians who were working on set theory at the time. Uh, the Zermelo ordinals, I can say out loud, so zero would be the empty set, one would be the set containing the empty set, and then two would be the set containing the set containing the empty set. And three would be the set containing the set containing the set containing the empty set and so on and so forth. Right. So, you know, you could count the number of curly brackets you're using <laughs> to tell you what number it is if you want. Uh, but the point is that uh, they just keep going like that. So they're just uh, sets inside of sets inside of set that contain the empty set for the Zermelo ordinals. And so that's what the natural numbers are for Johnny. Right. And then each of them, Ernie and Johnny, have to learn not just what the numbers are, but how do you go? You know, you need to know what the successor of each of them is, and you need to learn some properties about them so that you can um, work with them properly. But then, you know, that's what the that's what the natural numbers are. OK, fine. So now each Ernie and Johnny know what the natural numbers are inside of set theory for them, and they can translate this into talking to other people who don't know set theory, but just work with the natural numbers or the rational numbers or whatever. Great. So that's, that's great. They, they, that's very useful. Right. But then he, you know, Benassaraf comes to this point where he, he's trying to 
bring this cute story uh, that he that he started with to to more to what his point's going to be. And so now he comes to the second part of the essay, which is called The Dilemma. And he's saying that like Ernie and Johnny now are starting to compare notes with each other. And so he says, comparing notes, they soon become aware that something was wrong. For a dispute immediately ensued about whether or not three belonged to 17. Ernie said that it did and Johnny that it did not. And then skipping ahead. But they disagreed when Ernie claimed further that a set had N members, if and only if, it could be put into one-to-one -one correspondence with the number N itself. For Johnny, every number is single-membered, so that can't be done. In short, their cardinal relations were different. For Ernie, 17 had 17 members, while for Johnny, it had one member, and so it went. Okay, so this is the whole point of what Ben Asraf's trying to get at, that if you define the natural numbers as some particular set of sets inside the set theory, then it can't be the case that that's what the natural numbers are, right? Because uh, it, 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 it's a completely reasonable, pragmatic thing to do to communicate to people what you're trying to do and build natural numbers inside a set theory. This, he's not claiming that there's something wrong with that, but he's saying that can't be what the natural numbers are. And at this point in the essay, I can't help but feel like you know, the first time I read it before I knew where he was going with this, I was like, well, come on, of course not. I mean, no, no set theorist or mathematician is claiming that this is what the natural numbers are when they tell you, you know, how to embed them inside of set theory. I, I don't think any mathematician thinks that or, or set theorist. So, you know, what's Panasarev talking about here? I mean, we don't actually think that's what the natural numbers are, but I think actually he's, he's, he's leaving that obvious, uh, retort there on purpose because you'll see where he goes is he wants to take advantage of your your instinct there and and he's gonna he's trying to get you to play into his his overall argument um but what this uh what he's pointing out here is what joel david hampkins calls in his his philosophy of math books junk theorems right and they're junk theorems because you identify the natural numbers as a particular set of sets inside a set theory and then you could say weird things like you know, three is contained in the number 17, which is something you would never say about three and 17 if you were just studying the natural numbers um, on its own. It's only because you've embedded it inside of set theory that you start saying weird things like three inside of 17. But, you know, this is not just true of set theory. I mean, this is true of basically anytime you try to embed one structure into another one. So, you know, I don't know if this is a great example for the wider audience, but like if you tried to embed some group like the integers inside of um, a group of matrices, uh, that's a very reasonable thing to do. We do this all the time. But then the matrices, you'll be able to say things about the matrices, which are not theorems about the integers as a group, right? No, normally we don't say those kinds of things when we're talking about the group of integers inside of the you know some group of matrices. Um, we know how to be careful not to say not to focus on these sort of junk theorems about that are really just theorems about matrices and not theorems about uh, the group of integers. But the point is just that this issue that Ben Asraf's pointing out is true all over mathematics. Anytime you embed one structure inside of another, there's always this problem of, um, you know, these sort of junk theorems that you don't really want to state about the structure you started with. So, you know, that point is is worth pointing out. But also, like, anytime you try to say, like, what the real numbers are, what the natural numbers are, you you can wonder or worry about the fact that anytime you do that, you're always putting it inside of some structure, and there's always going to be these junk theorems that don't capture the, you know, the original structure you were trying to capture, like the natural numbers or the real numbers. So, okay, point taken. Um, so he's saying... That, you know, at this point in the in the in the essay, he's saying the natural numbers cannot actually be um, both sets of sets, the ones that Ernie and Johnny are talking about. And plus, those aren't the only only ones. Like, those are the ones that came up in history. But we know that you can come up with all kinds of other ways embedding the natural numbers inside of set theory. And he's, you know, any of those ways is not going to work. Um, so he asked this question: Is there a set of sets that has a greater claim to be the numbers than any others? Right. And, and, you know, I think the answer is, is no, but at this point he goes into a little bit of history, which is really interesting and important 
um, I think I'll do another video on this at some point, which is that Frege and then Russell uh, had this idea. So Frege had the idea and then Russell also championed this idea at some point to say that, you know, three is just the set of all sets with three elements in it, right? And this is very intuitive because usually when I try to explain, you know, if I try to explain to a child what three is, I might point to like three apples and then I might point to like three pears or something, right? And and I don't want them to get too stuck on the particular apples. I want them to try to abstract away the fact that it's the the threeness or whatever that you know that that we're looking at, right? So I might point to three apples, then three pears, and then three something else, so that I they start to understand that it's not about any of the particular groupings of objects, but the number, right? So if that's how we'd explain it, then maybe there's something to that. And so you say, okay, well, three is just the set of all sets. <clears throat> with three elements in it, right? So it's the set of three apples, the set of three pears, the set of three X's, you know, I, you know, whatever you want to um, put. But so it's a ginormous set then, right? Because you can imagine lots of different sets with three elements in it, right? So it's the collection of all sets with three elements in it. That's what three is. It's a very like natural definition. It's like the kind of definition you want to work. But what's interesting about it, so, you know, Frege, um, came up with this ideas a bit for set theory and then propositional logic, but then famously um, at the time, which we call naive set theory now, um, Russell pointed out that there was this issue, right? So the Zermelo-Russell paradox um, caused a problem with Frege's set theory, what we call naive set theory now. And the same thing with Cantor. And what's interesting, though, is that Russell then later on in his work defined three to be the set of all sets with three elements in it. What's interesting, though, is he didn't realize that his very paradox that he pointed out in Frege's work also applies to this characterization of three. So this doesn't work. You can say the set of all sets with three elements in it. The problem is that that set causes a contradiction, that Russell's paradox, and so it's not a well-defined set. So that means it cannot be a definition of three. And, you know, it, it's an interesting thing in history that um, Russell pointed out this mistake to Frege and then accidentally made the same mistake, though we should be careful because it's not quite the same, but wound up making in disguise the same mistake again. Um, this just points to how you can be really intelligent, good mathematicians and philosophers, but, you know, these things are very tricky and it's easy to make silly mistakes. Um, and you know, in this case, I think it, it's not even that easy mistake. So I'll do a video on that one time demonstrating to you what the mistake is exactly, uh, that Russell made. So, okay, that doesn't work either. Right. And so now let me, uh, read, we're getting to the end of the essay where he gets to his final point. Um, so <clears throat> he says, objects do not do the job of numbers singly. The whole system performs a job or nothing does. I therefore argue, extending the argument that led to the conclusion that numbers could not be sets, that numbers could not be objects at all. So there is no more reason to identify any individual number with any one particular object than with any other, not already known to be a number. Therefore, numbers are not objects at all, because in given the properties of numbers, you merely characterize an abstract structure. And the distinction lies in the fact that the elements of the structure have no properties other than those relating them to other elements of the same structure. Okay, so the point is that um, the reason why he left open this, what's felt really silly about, oh, the natural numbers are not, you know, this particular subset of the set theory, which seemed really clear to me, is because he's trying to get us to structuralism. So he wants us to feel like, yeah, of course, the natural numbers are not any particular embedding inside of set theory. They are somehow the relations that uh, that are between the different numbers. You know, the structure is what's important, right? So when we talk about structuralism, for instance, if we want to talk about the real numbers, <clears throat> we can talk about them as a complete ordered field. And the reason why that's a nice way to talking about them is because uh, in, in, under that, complete order fields are categorical, meaning that there is only one complete order field up to isomorphism. So there are lots of different ways of expressing complete order fields, which is like analogous to embedding the natural numbers 
inside of set theory. But, you know, the mathematician or the structuralist says it's not about any particular way of expressing the real numbers. Any particular way will have these junk theorems and, and will not quite capture what you want. It's the fact that up to isomorphism, there's only one complete order field. So that's the, it's the um, properties that are common amongst all these things, which is what makes the real numbers, right? It's the structure, not the particular elements, right? And I think I've said this before that um, I think structuralism is sort of the de facto philosophy for a lot of mathematicians. We don't even know that we're structuralists. It's what we've been sort of taught, I think, in a lot of ways is to think like structuralists. And it's also the way we work, too. Like when I work in Ramanian geometry, I work with the Ramanian manifolds. If I'm using the Ramanian structure, I expect to get results about Ramanian structures. If I'm working with the metric space, I expect to get results related to that. And if I'm working with smooth structures, I expect to get things related to that. We, ex we, we move in inside and out of structures all the time inside of our work. And we have a good sense of like what uh, any structure I'm working with, what's the kind of thing that that structure could entail, right? So we 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 think structurally all the time. Um, so I'm going to do another. Um, I'm going to do a talk just on structuralism at some point, and I'll point to uh, where in the other books that I've already talked about you can read about structuralism if you like. Let me just end by reading the last paragraph of, of Paul Benasserev's essay here. But I must stop here. I cannot defend this view in detail without writing a book. To return in closing to our poor abandoned children, I think we must conclude that their education was badly mismanaged, not from the mathematical point of view, since we have concluded that there is no mathematically significant difference between what they were taught and what ordinary mortals know. But from the philosophical point of view, they think that numbers are really sets of sets, while if the if the truth be known, there are no such things as numbers, which is not to say that there are not at least two prime numbers between 15 and 20. <laughs> so he, he punts a little bit and says, you know, I can't tell you exactly what structuralism is here. I need to write a whole book about it. But um, he ends with this nice little wrap up involving Ernie and Johnny again. And so, yeah, I want to I want to talk more about structuralism at some point. But uh, here check out this essay as a good introduction to that. And then I'll point to lots of other places you can read about structuralism and I'll do a video on that at some point uh, separately. Okay. Thanks for checking this out. Like comment and subscribe. And I hope to see you at another video.